Father in heaven, thank you so much for this wonderful Sabbath day you've given to us. Thank you, Lord, for your watch care over us. And as we're about to start our time together this morning to study your word, we ask for your Holy Spirit to please be with us, grace us with thy presence, O Lord, and may you send your Spirit to be our teacher and our guide, that we wouldn't use your Spirit, but your Spirit would use us and to illumine our minds and fill us, open our eyes that we may behold wondrous things out of thy word. And Lord, please, Lift us up from this world even now. Help us to put aside our distractions and help us, Lord, to focus now, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And so the message for this morning is the reformation needed in these last days. And what we studied in Nehemiah last time was that the book of the law was found and Ezra began to read from it each day. And as a result, what happened? People were convicted of their sins, they confessed, and they came and worshipped God. And ultimately, they came and celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles and the worship and the sanctuary services were restored in those times. And then Nehemiah recounted to them the wonderful works and merciful dealings of God in the past and how it was their sins that brought them into captivity and brought them into calamity and how the Babylonians and the Medo-Persians and even the Greeks, they would rule over them and how they ended up in that sad, sorry state. But they saw, God, they saw God's goodness towards them. And they, at that time, in Nehemiah's time, as Nehemiah was recounting all of this, they entered into a covenant with God again. And this bears repeating. What was that covenant they made with God? Well, we find it in Nehemiah chapter 10, verses 28 to 32. And there were, pardon me, there were a few things that they covenanted with God. First, they committed to keep the Ten Commandments again. Secondly, no more unequally yoked marriages and relationships. Thirdly, they committed to keep the Sabbath. And lastly, they committed to be faithful in their tithe and offering. And guess what? There was a great revival amongst them as they made this commitment to God again. And after this general revival, in Nehemiah chapter 11, the Jerusalem is repopulated and it's just a, it was just a, a list of names of who was in Jerusalem and who was in the surrounding towns and suburbs. And then in Nehemiah chapter 12, they would appoint roles for the temple again. And you find in Nehemiah chapter 12, I'm, I'm going through these, I'm just describing to you what's happening because really the meat of what we're studying this morning is found in Nehemiah 13. But in Nehemiah chapter 12, they are assigning all the roles for the sanctuary services, the priests and the Levites. And you'll see that they're looking at the genealogy because they're trying to determine who is a Levite because only the Levites could serve in the sanctuary, you see. And they had been in Babylon and Medo-Persia for a long time. And so the records were really important. They wanted to ensure that they were doing things the right way and that the blessing of God was upon them from the beginning again. And so the wall is re-established and completed and is rededicated. Treasurers are appointed so that the collection of tithes and offerings can be re-established because the Levites were now starting to work again. So they needed to be supported by the tithes and the offerings of the people. And after that, Nehemiah goes back to Persia in his position as the cupbearer to the king and he begins to serve the king again. But in Nehemiah chapter 13, Nehemiah now comes back for a second time as governor over Judea. And this is the closing chapter of Nehemiah. And what does he find when he comes back for this second time? Well, let's pick it up here in Nehemiah chapter 13 and starting in verse 1. On that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the, into the congregation of God forever, because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass, when they had heard the law, that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude." 
And so they find this history book and they realize that there should be this separation between the Moabite and the Ammonite with them. And so this group, they decide to separate from the unbelievers, from what the Bible here calls them the mixed multitude. Now friends, what do we understand about the mixed multitude in the Bible? Well, let's go to Numbers chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a lusting. And the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We remember the fish which we did eat uh, in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. But now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. Now, this mixed multitude was not the mixed multitude that it's talking about in Nehemiah. The composition of the people was not exactly the same, but what they represent was exactly the same. It's a group of people that were not Jewish or from the Israelite tribe. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, some Egyptians came with them as well because they looked at Egypt and it was destroyed. They were scared. Obviously, the, the, the God of the Israelites was much more, more far superior than the God that they were serving. And so they followed, but they weren't converted. And the mixed multitude was the ones that were always complaining. They were the ones that were just dissatisfied with the food that they were even eating. They were dissatisfied with the little rations of water or, or whatever it was. They just found places always to, to raise up complaint they were always the ones that were stirring trouble in the camp of Israel. And Israel would follow along with this mixed multitude, you see. And who was this group comprised of? Well, in Exodus 12, verse 37 and 38. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. And a mixed multitude went up also with them and flocks and herds even very much cattle. It wasn't just the children of Israel. There were other people as well. And so it was with Nehemiah's day. There was a group of people that came with them out of Persia. And look, it's not that we have to make the worldly people, in a sense, our enemies. But friends, let's not be their best friend and make them our counselor and our confidant. Let's make sure we minister to them and reach out to them. Be careful who you choose to hang out with and who you intermingle with. God said very clearly, they were not to come into the congregation of God forever. There was a clear line of distinction that was drawn between the two and the gr groups of people there, and that must be done today as well, friends. And so the first thing that we learn here in Nehemiah chapter 13 is that we have to separate from unbelievers. We have to separate from unbelievers. We have to be faithful to this. These are the lessons that we're learning in Nehemiah's day that is relevant to us as well. And we see these things repeating. I'm sure that as you open your eyes and see, these are the issues that are repeating even in our time as well. But what else did Nehemiah find when he came back for a second time? Let's continue, shall we? Nehemiah chapter 13 and verse 4. And before this, Eliashib the priest, having oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah, do you remember who Tobiah was? He was the one that was in league with Sanballat. They were the ones that were trying to call Nehemiah out so that they could hurt him or harm him or kill him. They were the ones that were trying to destroy and hinder the work of the wall being built to move forward. And now what do we find? What had happened with Tobiah? We keep reading in verse 5. Um, the, the priest of God, which was Eliashib, he had made and prepared for him a great chamber where aforetime they laid the meat offerings, the frankincense, and the vessels, and the tithes of the corn, and new wine, and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites, and the singers, and the porters, and the offerings of the priest. What had happened? 
You see, Eliashib, he went and made room for Tobiah right there next to the sanctuary in a room where they put all the tithes and the offerings which were reserved for the priests and the Levites. And he had infiltrated the camp of the Jews and made it um, in such a way that they were now misusing the tithes and the offerings because there was no place to keep it anymore. And what was going on here? Let's continue. Verses 7 to 9. And I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore. Therefore I cast forth all the household stuff of Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers. And thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. Nehemiah, he hears about it, and he comes and casts him out and cleans the room and puts back it, it for the use of the tithes and the offerings for which they intended in the first place. You know, he was doing a pretty strong work, kicking Tobiah out. And it seemed like, wow, he was pretty violent. But, you know, friends, this is needed in this day and age. Why? They were profaning the temple services and they started uh, the people started to see this and they began to give less and less tithe and offering. And as a result, what was happening? The Levites could not be supported. They had to go and do other work as well. And so look, friends, I think it's important for us to understand how the tithe and the offering is used. I think this is really important. You see, tithe and offering, tithe at least, what we see in the Bible, not how it's used today because, you know, many people misuse the tithe. But when you study about tithe in the Bible, you find that it's used for the support of the gospel minister. It's support of those that are doing the work of God. And, you know, uh, in our churches, we are quite transparent with how much tithe we collect. And even in our business meetings, we'll show you how we've been using the money as well. We'll give a detailed printout of how the expenses of the tithe has been used. Well, not the tithe, because we don't keep the tithe in our church. It goes to the mission, and then that it go, gets redistributed to the pastors in support for them. But we also show you how we use the offering that you put into the money bag each week. We are transparent. We want you to have full confidence that we are using the tithe and the offering that you give um, out of the, the, the sweat and the labor of what you earn in the week, that you, it's being used rightly in a certain way. We want you to have confidence that when you put that money in the bag, you can have confidence that it will be used in the proper way. And even with tithe, friends, I hope that you have seen in this past year that I've been busy as a gospel minister. You know, I've been preaching many, many weeks. At the beginning, when the, the MCO first started, I was preaching four times a week for a Friday night, then a Sabbath school, then divine service, and then a closing Sabbath. And then I was able to, uh, the, the, the Sabbath school started up, and then I was able to find people to do Sabbath uh, evening. And so all I have is a Friday night and a Sabbath morning. And it's been busy. It's been tiring writing two sermons a week as well. You know, when I preach, when I pass the two churches, it's much easier because I preach it on this one Sabbath and then on the other Sabbath, I don't have to prepare much. I just have to review it because I'm preaching to a new congregation that hasn't heard it. And I just have to prepare one sermon every two weeks. But in the time of pandemic, man, it's been busy. Last year, I preached a possible 47 of the 52 Sabbaths. And so I easily preached over 100 sermons just last year for the weekend. But not just that, you see the offerings. How about the offerings, the money that you put in the money bag, the ones that you give to our local church budget? Um, why do people give so little? Maybe it's because you don't see that we have that, mu that much need. So it's important to share with the churches um, what we do at the leadership level to determine how this money is being used. Well, what do we use it for? Well, the missionary book of the year. We buy those books and we distribute it for free. We, we've bought at a very subsidized cost the, the discipleship handbook as well, but we make those available for our church members. We haven't charged you a single cent, but if you feel burdened to give, you can give it back to, to the, the mission and our church as well. 
We've also have a welfare fund which we set up, which has been used very much in this past year because we've been in this time of pandemic and many people have lost their jobs. Money has not been able to be gained, whether it's from, from people sending overseas and other people that have come overseas, their families have been affected. And so we've used this to support our church members and people that have attended our churches as much as possible, even to the extent uh, relatives of church members as well who have been hurt very badly. And even the Bible workers, um, one group, that on DAC side, they've been going to Lumba Subang and they've been feeding the poor. We've been buying groceries for them. We have constant health checks for them. All the consumables that we buy for the glucose strips and the batteries and all these things that we have to buy, the masks that the Bible workers wear on a daily basis to go out to serve the community. All these things cost money. And then they've been having, having health talks as well. And even the church has been so, so uh, generous to, to buy that camera that, that I'm looking at right in front of me right now to, to help me to get on and live stream as well and to buy this equipment so that we can come online. Um, the Bible workers are visiting church members and the churches, they pay for all the petrol and the, and the upkeep of the cars. And even the Bible workers on SAC side, they've been working hard at APU and in the community, buying health equipment as well. And we were the first on campus to run a health check when APU University was open so that we can meet the needs of the students and many students they were even having trouble buying groceries and feeding themselves as well. And so we've been busy in the community as well. And I guess just a note to the leaders, you know, the purpose of collecting all this money is not to save up for a new church building or make one big purchase, you know, but friends, we have to also plan wisely in how we can use this money to be a blessing in the communities that we live in. And even for the Bible Worker Fund, you know, many times uh, I, every week I'm, I'm announcing that, but you know, we've had to buy another Bible Worker car during this time because we have 13 Bible Workers. The stipends, it's not much, but you know, we, we, we pay the Bible Workers each month as well. And we have a general outflow from our Bible Worker Fund of around 20,000 a month. And so these are big expenses. And by the grace of God, I just thank God that People have been donating and putting money in, and you have the right to understand how all this money is being used. Even the Bible workers in Monkiara, we've recently started up a health check over there at the plaza there, and we've been reaching and meeting many people there as well. God has been really blessing the work, and the people, our Bible workers, and different church members have been really busy, and I praise God for that. But you see, friends, I want you to have confidence that when you put that money into that bag, it's going to be used for the right purposes. Not so that the Bible workers can have a more lavish lifestyle or myself, but that we can use that funds to further the work of God, even especially in this time when it's so difficult to work in the pandemic. But surely God is blessing. But more than anything else, friends, it's not the money that God needs to finish the work. It's your heart. Do come and join us on Sunday mornings for United Prayer because truly that is where the work, the real work is really done. But anyways, coming back to the story of Nehemiah chapter 13, because the people saw that the funds were being misapplied, they lost confidence in giving of their tithes and their offerings. And this had a waterfall effect. Verses 10 to 13 of Nehemiah 13. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them. For the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled everyone where? To his field. They didn't have enough to support themselves. Then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then brought all Judah, the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil unto the treasuries. And I made treasurers over the treasuries, Shelemiah the priest and Zadok the scribe and of the Levites, Padiah. And next to them was Hanan, the son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah, for they were counted faithful. And their office was to distribute unto their brethren. You know, friends, the lessons here parallel our time. If we want revival and reformation to take place in our church, 
This is one of the areas that Nehemiah talks about, making sure that we are faithful to our tithe and our offering, to make sure that the gospel work is supported and carried forward. And we need faithful people in these positions. And friends, I assure you that we have two wonderful ladies in DAC and SAC, faithful women that work extra hours to make sure that our tithe and our offering and our books are in proper order and that the funds are distributed accordingly. And so that when you put in funds for a specific um, ministry or work, we appropriate to that ministry and make sure that it is used for that purpose. But friends, if we want true revival and reformation, even in our time, I cannot over, uh, overstate the importance of being faithful in our tithes and our offerings. But I believe that there are still people, pastors, that are called to the gospel work, but they suffer for want. And so they're constantly thinking about money, how to support their families, how to just make a living. And some, they leave the call of God to go and work in other fields and areas which God did not call them, but because the tithe and offering was being misappropriated. But, you know, let's get back to the story. You know, what is the next issue that Nehemiah encountered? Let's continue reading in Nehemiah 13 and verse 15. In those days I saw in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and lading asses, as also wine, grapes, and figs, and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein, which brought fish and all manner of ware, and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do, and profane the Sabbath day? Did your fathers, did not your fathers thus, and did not God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet you bring more wrath upon Israel by profaning the Sabbath. What were they doing? They were breaking the Sabbath. And Nehemiah was calling them back to faithful on the Sabbath, faithfulness on the Sabbath. He reminded them, have you forgotten? That the reason why we went into captivity in the first place is because we were breaking the Sabbath, we were profaning the law of God? He had to remind them, well, you're going to bring us back into captivity if you keep doing this. And friends, we have a long history of what we read in the Bible about how the people were unfaithful to God, even on the Sabbath, and God brought upon them, or at least He withdrew their protecting, His protecting care, and Babylon, and Medo-Persia, and even the Assyrians before that, they came and conquered them and made them subservient to them. And needless to say, friends, this is a big issue in our day as well, profaning of the Sabbath hours. Remember, the commitment and the covenant that was made to God on your baptismal day. And friends, what, what happened, the three things that, that followed for the Israelites, they covenanted to, to follow Him. One of them was the Sabbath. How important is it? It's a holy and a special day. Maybe familiarity with it that we come across it every single week has made us take it for granted and made this, this special and sanctified day lose its holiness and specialness to each and every one of us. But friends, what's very interesting is, why is it that they ended up breaking the Sabbath? Look at what the pen of inspiration writes. Prophets and kings 671 paragraph 1. Another result of intercourse with idolaters was a disregard of the Sabbath, the sign distinguishing the Israelites from all other nations as worshippers of the true God. Did you catch that? What was the reason why these people ended up breaking the Sabbath? It was their connection with idolaters, their mingling with people of other faith. And as a result, the, the, the specialness of the Sabbath lost its sanctity and its holiness. The, the intercourse with idolaters, the, the, the desire for gain, 
connecting ourselves with people of other faiths. And whether that's in business practice with another person, you know, maybe you're a business owner and you're in league with another person and, and your co-partners for, for this business and they don't believe in the Sabbath. They're not even Christian maybe. And maybe you're saying, well, it's just business, you know, but friends, you know, when we make union with unbelievers, it waters down our own belief system. Do you know that? It really does. And look, I, I don't understand this because I'm, I'm not doing this, but you know, maybe partnership with friends or family. Yes, even though it might be family and they're not believers, you gotta be careful. And even those that are in relationships, maybe you're saying, well, well, I still come to church. It's not about just coming to church, friends. It's about understanding how holy and how blessed and how sanctified these hours are. Are you keeping really the Sabbath holy? Do you understand its importance? You know, for us, Sabbath has become a footnote to us. The day that we rest, the day that we sleep, it isn't no, it's no longer a day that we look forward to. Sunday is the most important day to us, or the close of Sabbath, so I can go back and, and do my worldly things and start earning money or, or go out shopping and, and have fun in nature and, and do all these things that Sabbath seems to be holding us back. It's almost as if Sabbath has become a day that we dread and not look forward to. Oh, I can't wait for Monday to start. Then I can start earning money again and, and start making progress in my career. Sabbath has become a footnote. Sabbath has become a hindrance and it seems to disrupt the flow and ebbs of our life and our aims and our goals. But we as Seventh-day Adventists, we have to come back to it. We've lost our peculiarity and there needs to be a coming back to the Sabbath. It was needed back then in the day of Nehemiah and friends, it surely parallels our time, which leads us finally to the last issue that Nehemiah had to deal with. Let's go back to Nehemiah chapter 13, and now reading verses 23 to 27. In those days also, I saw Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and of Moab. And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them, and cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. Did not Solomon king of Israel sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him, who was beloved of his God. And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish woman cause to sin. Shall we then hearken unto you to do this great evil to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? What was the issue that Nehemiah had to deal with here? Intermarriage with unbelievers. And this was the fourth issue, unequally yoked relationships, which are very much tied in with the Sabbath and the giving of tithe and offerings. So it seems like faithfulness to the first one is really the same as that fourth one that you're seeing here on this list, to separate from unbelievers, not be unequally yoked in relationship with them. You know, friends, this is such an important issue when you look at, at what Nehemiah was going through, he's like, you have to make sure that you do not let your children, your, your sons and your daughters marry unbelievers, even though you've gone down this path already. And he gave the illustration of Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. Yet he was pulled away to worship Baal and all these other gods because of the wives that he had married, because they were heathen. They were not of the same faith. And we are nowhere clear, cl close as, as how Solomon was in wisdom. Let's not think that we are smarter than him. It took a few hundred of wives to pull Solomon away from his faithfulness to God. But in our day, without the wisdom of Solomon that he had from God, it'll only take one. 
Friends, we need to be so careful because why? This affected the whole nation. Solomon's unfaithfulness when he connected with these heathen wives, he ended up pulling the whole nation away from God. He would build temples for his wives, uh, uh, for their gods to worship at, which ultimately he himself would bow down and worship as well. Why was this such a big issue? It wasn't just the common people, you know. It really started at the top. Let me read to you a quote. Prophets and Kings, 674, paragraph 1. There were some in sacred office who pleaded for their heathen wives, declaring that they could not bring themselves to separate from them. But no distinction was made. No respect was shown for rank or position. Whoever among the priests or rulers refused to sever his connection with idolaters was immediately separated from the service of the Lord. A grandson of the high priest, having married a daughter of the notorious Sanballat, was not only removed from office, but promptly banished from Israel. You know, friends, this really showed the importance of the sacred office and the purity that was needed in the work of God. And we need that in this day as well, friends. Nehemiah, he made them promise not to give their sons or daughters to, to the unbelievers. But then he went and looked for those that were married to unbelievers and said, you cannot be in this position if you are so. And so he had to remove them. Friends, this is the fidelity, the, the, the faithfulness that is needed to God even in these days that we are living in. But I'm telling you, the churches, we, we get afraid. We get afraid that they're going to leave church. But you know, Nehemiah went so far to smack him over the head and he banished them himself before they even had a chance to walk out the door. You know, friends, I'm not saying that we should banish people, but we have to have what? The work of God in such high regard. Yes, we have to preserve the, the purity of the work and the importance of the work and the high calling of the work. We need this. And even for today, friends, for those that are married to unbelieving spouses, you got to be even more faithful. You have to have your head and your shoulders above water to show them who the true God is. And often the reason why a person marries an unbeliever in the first place is because they themselves are being unfaithful. There is a need for revival and reformation in our day to day. There's much work to be done and it's not going to be easy. Don't think that Nehemiah was just like that and he was built that way and that's why he was able to do that. But friends, I'm telling you, Nehemiah, he went through a lot just to stand up and to be faithful and to do the work that he did. It seemed violent. It seemed like so strong. But I'm telling you, don't think he didn't think twice about this. Look at what the pen of inspiration writes. Prophets and Kings 674, paragraph 2. How much anguish of soul this needed severity cost the faithful worker of God. The judgment alone will reveal. There was a constant struggle with opposing elements and only by fasting, humiliation and prayer was advancement made. You know, don't think Nehemiah just came in and, and he started changing everything. He really had to pray. He had to fast. He had to think long and hard about this before he went and did it. But it said there that he had so much pain in his heart to have to do this. And I'm sure that he paused sometimes wondering whether he was doing the right thing or not. But friends, he wasn't acting on his own accord. It was God that was guiding him. We need today people who are willing to pray, people who are willing to wake up early on a Sunday morning and pray together with the believers of the church. We need people who are willing to humble themselves and, and are willing to work. We need people that who won't listen to others and, and who, who won't be afraid to, to, to just offend people because of the truth's sake. Friends, we got to be faithful to the message. We got to be careful with how we treat people, yes we got to be careful that we are faithful to God first. 
and we shouldn't be worried about the results. We should be worried about how that one person that we allow to be left in office will have a, a, a leavening influence over the whole congregation that would be for the worse. That is the sort, that's the sort of result that we have to consider and, and ponder. But friends, God is calling all of us today. He's calling all of us to be Nehemiahs. And these are the four issues that will plague the people in the last days. And we got to make sure that we call people to separate from unbelievers, to make sure that we're not in league with them in business and in relationships. We've got to be faithful to the tithe and the offering. In a day and age, yes, when so many churches are just calling out for it so they can support themselves. But friends, it's not about just support, but it's making sure that we are faithful. And then we've got to call people to be faithful, especially on the Sabbath. Such an important day. The seal of God, the sign of our loyalty to Him. And then we've got to have a clear call about making sure that people are not unequally yoked in their relationships. These are the areas of reform that need to take place today. The Bible is not dated. God knows that history will repeat itself. And I'm sure that if you open your eyes today and look around you, you will see that these are the main issues that are plaguing our churches. And maybe some of you are sitting here this morning thinking, ah, Ben's pointing me out. Friends, I'm not pointing anybody out. I'm just preaching the truth. Have I become your enemy? As Paul said, because I preach to you and share with you the truth, is there anywhere in there that you have seen this morning of self or personal gain? Do you think that I'm doing it just to attack you? Do you think that I'm just calling you out because I'm upset at you and don't like you? Friends, I urge you to go back and read Nehemiah chapter 13 and see whether the things that I've shared with you this morning are from the Word of God or not. But lastly, I want to share with you a quote taken from Prophets and Kings again, 675, paragraph 3. The success attending Nehemiah's efforts shows what prayer, faith, and wise energetic action will accomplish. Now look at this. Nehemiah was not a priest. He was not a prophet. He made no pretension to high title. He was a reformer raised up for an important time. It was his aim to set his people right with God. Inspired with a great purpose, he bent every energy of his being to its accomplishment. High, unbending integrity marked his efforts. As he came into contact with evil and opposition to right, he took so determined a stand that the people were roused to labor with fresh zeal and courage. They could not but recognize his loyalty, his patriotism, and his deep love for God. And seeing this, they were willing to follow where he led. Do you see that, friends? Nehemiah was not a priest. He never called himself a prophet, even though that book of Nehemiah was written. He made no pretension to a high title. He just loved God. He just had a love for God and His work and for His people. And today, friends, you do not need the title of a pastor to do the work of God. In fact, many times it's a hindrance because people expect you to live a certain way. But we need people that are willing to do the work because of their great love for God, that they're willing to stand up and be counted. You don't need a position in church to make an impact in the church. You don't need to sit on the church board to be a blessing over the whole church. But it doesn't matter. You don't need this title, friends. You just need a calling. And I'm telling you, friends, many are called, but few are chosen because many do not want to stand up and be counted in the work. Friends, I believe that God is calling you today. I know that He's calling all of His people in the church today to stand up and to give the trumpet a certain sound, to, to put at the very front 
the work of God above everything else, above their studies, above their work, above their relationships, above their families, that they're willing to make Jesus first, last, and best in everything. Why? Because they love God with all their heart, soul, strength, and might. And so they push forward. They're willing to, to, to counsel people, to call out sin in the church and not wait for the pastor to do it. They're willing to stand up and to do the work of God because it needs to be done in this day and age. Friends, we all need to be like Nehemiah. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 4, the Bible says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. It seems like God is calling us to be busybodies. Yes, He is. To be busybodies, not in gossip but in the gospel work. Big difference. God, He wants us to be busy in soul saving, in soul winning, in being a light, in being a blessing to the whole world. Starting with your family, your friends, the community, the influence that you have. God, He's not waiting for you to to go and study theology and then just come back and then you can start serving Him. No, friends. He wants you to be a blessing right now, wherever you are, to be a Nehemiah right here in Malaysia right now. Friends, you don't need to have a title before you can stand up and do the work. You don't need to be voted into church office. I just pray that the love of God and His zeal would be burning in your heart to finish the work today. Friends, what will it be? Will you stand up and be counted? Or maybe the love of God is waning in your heart. You need to come back to Him, sit in His presence. You need to come and pray with us. You need to come and join Sabbath school more. You need to come and study His Word more. You got to pray for the Holy Ghost to fill your heart with the love of God that is wider and deeper than any issue or problem that might come your way. And then, friends, then we'll be repairers of the breach. Then we'll stand in the gap and be counted in these last days. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you for the example of Nehemiah. And oh, Father, it just speaks so clearly to our hearts. The issues that we're facing in the church, it's just there. Help us not to point fingers and find the fault and why it's happening, but help us to stand up and be counted like Nehemiah, to be problem solvers, to be reformers in our day and age. And Lord, open our eyes today to help us to see that you're calling us, calling us to stand up and be counted in that regard. May you please pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Give us the zeal of Nehemiah. And more than that, give us the passion and the love that he had for you and for his people. Lord, we realize that we are living in serious times. We're living in unusual times. Help us not to get used to this. Help us to be uncomfortable in this world so that we can push forward and finish the work here in our lifetime. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen.